When I was a kid, we didn't have a ton of money, so most of my computers were from what I could find at thrift stores, and the best I had at the time was a 486SX25. My neighbor, however, had the first Pentium, the 60 megahertz, overclockable to 60 megahertz, and I remember games like Need for Speed and him playing multi-user dungeons, and I admit I was pretty jealous. The P5 was released as a socket 4 chip, and it was the precursor to the Pentium Pro, had almost as much gold content in the chip, and most people had never heard of the 60 megahertz variant, it wasn't super popular. At the time, the top end 486s were cheaper and sometimes even faster. And there were heat buildup issues, and there's probably some press around the FDIV bug that the 60 megahertz had, and it cost Intel over $450 million. I remember my friend actually running the exact calculation that would demonstrate the bug just for fun, and then installing a software fix for it. But the bug didn't really matter, because it would only ever come up in rare scientific situations, and you'd never notice what running Windows or DOS. The processor had basically no upgrade path. There were no other CPUs released for the four, or socket 4 board. Two reference boards were produced, one code named Batman that didn't really make it to the market, and the other, which was downclocked to 60 MHz, called Batman's Revenge. I managed to score one of these boards from a couple of wonderful ladies selling off their dad's amazing computer collection. Mac had a computer store in Vancouver not far from here, and he was an amazing guy with a personal retro collection. Um, that rivaled them all, and uh, I owe a lot of my collection to the amazing things that he kept. Anyway, let's look over this board and its features. So the board actually has a built-in I.O. controller, which means it's got the floppy, two serial ports, printer port, and two IDE all on the motherboard, which is pretty common in the more modern 486s and pretty much every board after this. Just past the uh, IDE connectors, you'll notice a collection of jumper jumpers that are oddly named J6 slash 1 2 and J7 slash 1 2 3, etc. And these were pretty advanced at the time. They would let you clear the CMOS, flash the BIOS, and even recover it um, if you flash the wrong stuff. And it even had password on or off and it allowed you to choose monochrome or color VJ adapters. It's one of the first boards you could also update the BIOS with software like a floppy. Um, it was a pretty simple BIOS compared to modern ones and not really any different than a 486 BIOS. Just like a 486, the board could support a max of 128 megs of 72 pin RAM. It supported parity and non-parity RAM. The onboard cache wasn't upgradable, it was soldered to the board. It was 256K. And at the front of the board, you've got these case connectors for the speaker, key lock, reset, power LED, hard disk light, and the turbo switch and turbo LED, which you don't see the turbo switch and turbo LED much anymore. Nowadays, we just like to run the board at full speed, but that allowed you to run some older games. You certainly don't uh, uh, see these kinds of machines very often. As I mentioned, it, they were pretty rare, and I have a lot of fond memories of watching uh, my friend play the 60 megahertz machine, but also uh, if they ever went away on vacation, I got to borrow the usage of it as well. Um, these days, my 8-core i9 3.6 GHz machine with a 5 case display suits me just fine, but I thought you'd all enjoy a trip down memory lane and a cool look at Batman's Revenge. It was a, uh, a really wild motherboard at the time and a really awesome computer, the very first Pentium ever released, and uh, it signified big change for Intel. And the chips that would come after based on this architecture basically changed PC computing history forever. Thank you for watching this old tech.